Hello, Ted Augusta. Awesome. So when the South Carolina Department of Revenue um, had 6 million taxpayers' personally identifiable information stolen, that was either a calculated, acceptable loss, or it was a failure of their risk management process. Likewise, when Anthem Insurance Company allowed attackers to steal the medical information from more than 80 million customers, that event was either an acceptable loss or it was a failure of their risk management process. Now, events such as those that I've described are complex things and they often occur as a result of some failure of a security control, but in the end it all comes down to risk management. So, you'll see a couple of formulas here on the slide. We all use formulas like this, either consciously or consciously, consciously or unconsciously, to make decisions about risk every day. So, our risk is equal to our vulnerabilities multiplied by the presence of a threat to take advantage of that vulnerability. Now, I think that most people, most organizations, have a very good understanding of what their vulnerabilities are. The companies that I described probably had long lists of, of all the vulnerabilities that they had in their company. And likewise, we all know what our vulnerabilities are. Understanding the vulnerabilities is never the problem. It's, it's that second part of the formula, understanding the threat. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, is understanding the threat so we can get a better understanding of that. When we talk about threat, we use the second formula we see up here. Our, our threat is equal to a capability, the, the, the threat's capability of impacting our vulnerability, multiplied by their intention to take advantage of our vulnerabilities. So let's talk about that. When we come to a busy intersection, we want to cross the street, we all know that cars are capable of impacting our vulnerability to damage, right? A, a motor vehicle running over me would not be a pleasant day. So why aren't we afraid to cross the street? It's because of how we look at the threat. We don't look at the threat, we don't look at all the drivers on the, on the road and say they're all intending to run me over. If I believed that all the drivers on the road were intending to run me over, I would probably consider crossing the street a much more risky prospect than I do today. Conversely, if we think that a threat has the capability of impacting our vulnerability, but has no intention to do so, or no, excuse me, has the intention to uh, impact our vulnerability, but isn't capable of doing so, then we're also not cap uh, worried about that threat. Uh, that's why we don't see a lot of movies coming out of Hollywood, like Attack of the Zombie Goldfish. Right? It, it just doesn't instill much fear. We're not worried about that type of a threat. So what do you think? Are you a target from attackers today? When I ask most people that question, the answer that I get most commonly is, you know what, I don't have anything on my computer of value. Or attackers, just, they're just not interested in me and getting on my system. And when they do that, they're questioning the attacker's intent, the second part of that uh, threat equation. But history has shown us that attackers do attack the average person's computer and gain access to their systems, whether it's to get in and steal their banking information or just grab contacts of friends and family so they can scam them, or it's to use their computer as a launching point to attack a more secure network like businesses and governments, or even worse, we'll see attackers will break into computer systems to store information on their computers that they don't want on their own computers, like illegal material like child pornography, Attackers do break into the home computers of the average user all the time and use them for their own nefarious means. So it's oftentimes the people who question the attacker's intent that are already compromised by these attackers. So the other way that we misjudge attackers is we misjudge their capability. Now, I'm not saying that we think that attackers aren't capable of breaking into our computers. Most people would say, you know what, uh, a virus or an attacker, they could probably break into my system. I think the way that we misjudge them is that we misjudge who these capable attackers are. We tend to think of attackers as these pimple-faced high school wizards, right, who sit up all night drinking Mountain Dew and pizza and just breaking into computers for no particular reason, with no, nothing in mind other than just to have some fun on the internet, or some nation-state super spy. And while both of those categories exist, I think that the real problem is much more sinister. I think that there's a lot more attackers out there than they're actually, uh, than we tend to think of. And that's one of the problems with thinking of them in those two categories of high school kids and nation-state spies, is 
it puts them into a very small number of people that really wouldn't have much interest in breaking into our computers. It puts them in an almost, mis uh, an almost mythical state, like the all-powerful Wizard of Oz who can do anything but doesn't necessarily have the intention of breaking into our personal computers. So I think the truth is much more sinister and that anyone with some small moniker of technical experience or technical skills and just a desire to do so and access to YouTube can break into our computers. So look around the room here. Um, how many people in this room, forget about intention for just a minute, and let's just talk about capability. How many people do you think in this computer, or in this, this room here, are capable of breaking into your computer? Well, I actually had a chance to walk around the audience and talk to some people. I can tell you that some of the most talented hackers in the world are sitting in this conference room with you today. As a matter of fact, uh, here in Augusta, Georgia, uh, not too long ago, we had a conference called the B-Sides Security Augusta Conference. And at that conference, more than 500 different security professionals from around the world came here to Augusta, Georgia to get together to talk about techniques for breaking into computers and how to defend them. So there's a lot of people that are capable of doing this. And that 500 people that I mentioned, that's just barely scratching the surface of the number of people who are capable of breaking into your computer. Based on my experience in using these hacking tools, I believe that just about anyone can watch some videos, put together a very effective attack that would work against most people in many organizations. So they mentioned I am a professional penetration tester. I, I will break into companies' networks for a fee and show them what all the vulnerabilities are that, they, that I use to get into their systems. So let's go through a scenario um, that I would use with a typical company just to show you how simple these attacks are, how really just about anybody can do it, and see how we would do. So I've done some reconnaissance on your, your company. I have an understanding of the organization. I know who your boss is. I know what car he drives. And before you arrive at work, I come in and I place a DVD behind the back tire of your boss's vehicle. When you come to work, you see this DVD sitting there. And when you bend over to take a closer look, you see this. Layoffs 2016. <laughs> Salary information. Your interest is peaked. Do you pick up the DVD? Do you carry it in with you? Many people will pick up this DVD and carry it in with you. And simply putting that computer into your computer DVD drive, or I love USBs. USBs are awesome. Drop those in the parking lot as well. Either one of those, just sticking it in the computer, sometimes that's enough in itself to give me access to that computer. But other times it requires that you click on the executable that I've on, put on the CD. So here, you put it in your computer and you see this on your computer. Okay? <laughs> Do you click on it? What type of wizardry did I need in order to create this executable? Let's take a peek behind the curtain and look and see what it did, what I did to create this video or this, uh, this, this Excel spreadsheet. So it started off as virus.exe, but nobody's going to click on virus.exe, right? So I used my elite hacking skills to rename the file. And I renamed the file to layoffs2016.xls.exe, but this is where the hacker skills come in. I can't just get rid of that exe because that's what tells Microsoft to run it as a program when they click on it instead of opening up Excel. So how do I get rid of that exe? Well, Microsoft allows up to 255 characters in the name, so I'll just put a bunch of spaces between the xls and the .exe until exe disappears off the side of the screen. And here you'll see various views of how that might look in Explorer if you were depending upon your settings. That was hard, wasn't it? required elite nation-state skills for me to put that together that virus to get people to click on it. Now, just about anyone can do simple tricks like this to gain access to you and your information. Let's try another one. You come, and this is, this is a question that you have to ask yourself every single day. You come to work, and you open up your inbox, and you see something that looks like this. A bunch of emails. All right, which one of these is the virus? Mm. Well, what, all right, what can we use to figure out which one is the virus? I can look at the sender, right? Maybe there's some people in here that I trust, right? It's from my mom. My mom's never going to send me a virus. Okay. Well, maybe my mom would send me a virus. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> anybody can pretend to be anybody else. So the sender, that's not going to give us any useful information. How about the subject line? 
Can I look at the subject line? No, no useful data there. How about whether or not it has an attachment? If it has an attachment, then I should be suspicious, but if there's no attachment, I'll be okay. Now, the fact is that you don't need an attachment. I can send you links to webmails or, or just the email itself, but oftentimes links embedded in emails can be the virus. So I don't have to have an attachment for there to be a virus. So how do we figure out which one of these is the virus? How about this? We'll open up every single one of them and see which one our antivirus software alerts on, right? Like an, element, an elephant through a field of landmines, we just open up everything and see what explodes. Isn't that what we do every single day? We just open up, we don't know. And here's, here's the, that, the thing, is that defense might actually be a good one. If someone else received that virus, and then they opened up the virus, and then they figured out that they were infected, and then they contacted an antivirus company, and the antivirus company um, received the virus, and they created a signature, and they released the signature, and then you downloaded the antivirus software, and you updated your antivirus software, then that process would work just fine. But the fact is, that's a lot of ifs. And if I am targeting you, if I've decided I'm going to come after you, I'm going to create a virus that is not going to be detected by your antivirus software. It's going to be unique, and only it's, you're going to be the first person to see it. There's not going to be any signature. So unfortunately, a defense like that, while it might be effective against, a, effective against a massive attack against everyone, it's not going to work for a targeted attack. So which one of these was the virus? Did you figure it out? I don't know. Maybe they're all viruses. I, that, I, that's not what we want to get to. What I want to get to is the point where you start thinking about the next time you look at your email, I want you to ask yourselves a couple of questions or think about a couple of things. When you think about the attacker's intention, first, recognize that attackers do have the intent to break into your computer. And secondly, when you think about their capability, well, first, don't underestimate the capability of attackers. I, I know some very talented attackers who can break into just about the most secure network that there is. But at the same time, I don't want you to overestimate the skill that's required to come into this career field that we call hacking, because I believe that just about anybody is capable of doing this. And when we put attackers into this super elite status, that there are these almost mythical creatures, we underestimate what the threat actually is. And the question that most people are probably thinking right now is, all right, well, what do I do? What do I do to defend myself against these attackers? The sad truth is that I don't think that the average person with their home networks has the skills or resources in order to defend themselves against a targeted attack by an, by an attacker. It's just too difficult. Companies have huge staff full of information security professionals and large budgets that they use to defend themselves. And they still get broken into by targeted attacks. It happens all the time. But what you can do is not make it easy on the attackers, right? What we can do is practice some basic defensive skills. Keep our software up to date. Keep our antivirus software up to date. Install all your patches. And if you think you've been compromised, seek professional help. I can tell you, if you're using the latest versions of operating systems, as an attacker, those reputation filters that they have on those systems, right? You, you click on a virus, or you click on a, a virus. You click on an executable, and Windows warns you that, hey, in the history of the internet, I've never seen this executable before. You're the only person in the world that's going to run this program. Do you trust it? Yeah, maybe. Maybe you shouldn't trust it. So the latest antivirus software, the latest operating systems do have some things that are going to help you in order to give you some, a chance to defend yourself against these things. But what I want you to do is to stop thinking of these attackers as these elite nation-state attackers, um, these, these pimple-faced kids, these small subset of people that really would have no interest in breaking into your computers. Don't think of them as this all-powerful Wizard of Oz. Instead, now that we've peeked behind the curtain, recognize the truth, that just about anybody could be an attacker. The all-powerful Wizard of Oz might just be a short, fat guy from Kansas. Thank you. <laughs>